This is Control Structure, episode 117, for October 19th, 2016. This show has show notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs117 to see them. The opinions expressed on this program are not the opinions of anyone's employer, nor of that of the nexus.tv. They are solely the opinions of those who express them, just in case if you were a little retarded about that. And I am Andrew Bailey, your host, and with me today is another host, Stephen Orvis. Hi, Chris. And today, a special ex-host, Christopher Thompson. Hello. So, um, how have you been, Chris? I've been doing pretty good. Haven't been up too much. Yeah, like I hear, I hear uh, you have a kid back there somewhere, and like not many games... Yep, just battling into the adult life. Yeah, kind of sucks though. But you can, eh, but you can benefit. You can kind of do anything you want, as long as you don't run out of money or time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> mm. So, uh, yeah, it's so much better when you're a kid and your parents have unlimited money and your summer vacation and you have time. You just have to convince them that hey. <laughs> We shouldn't buy uh-huh. food this month. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, have you been eating this month, Steve? Have I been eating this month? I have been eating this month. We just had pizza, even. Yes. So, um, it seems the uh, the pizza place at one of the bottoms of the hill uh, is, you know, is has a pretty good deal with the buy one get one free on, on Tuesdays. Yes, pick up on Tuesdays. Nice. So, um, meanwhile, I have been, uh, well, I guess I have been, uh, walking around down to the T and taking the T to work. So, like, that's the light rail here in Pittsburgh. Okay. Yeah, it, it only goes, like, from downtown down to the south of Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's the only pl- places that it goes. But, uh, yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so it was, you know, we're recording the day before it actually releases, so it would have been Monday that uh, I wake up and it's raining outside. I'm like, okay, well, this should be clearing up pretty fast. So I pull up the uh, weather report and look at the radar, and we're, like, right on the uh, back end. Like, the edge is, like, almost here. So I'm like, okay, whatever, take a shower, eat your breakfast, maybe grab an umbrella, and, like, it should be ending. So get outside, you know, it's still sprinkling, and then it starts pouring in a few places, and I'm like, this sucks. So I walk into the office, and I'm kind of, like, soaked. (laughs) It looks like (laughs) I've been holding a fire hose or something. (laughs) Wow. And, uh, you know, but I didn't really worry about it, nothing was broke. And the air inside the office is always dry. So, like, by noon, I was completely dry. So, uh, and then and then my manager is like, dude, like, you should have called me or something. You know, I would have picked you up at the station. So, it's like, that's ah, all right. I'll, I'll take the hit. So, um, let's see. Last weekend was actually pretty warm. So, I... Uh, took the bike down to the T and uh, rode around downtown a little bit along the rivers. So, and then, uh, yeah, then it was weekend before it was just too cold. So, yeah, we're in that time of year where it's hot, cold, hot, cold. So, Mm. uh, but, uh, yeah, fun times. And, uh, oh, yeah, coming up later this week, uh, I will be going to the Circleville Pumpkin Show back in Ohio. So that's basically a street fair that's pumpkin themed. Is that the place where they like launch pumpkins on a launcher and like have a competition to see who can shoot you know, the furthest? You know, Pastor mentions that all the time, and I've never seen such a thing in person. Okay. I think he needs to go see a psychologist because he might be hallucinating. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's not that violent as far as I know, and I've been there like several times. Could be fun. But, uh, anyways, uh, speaking about fun, and since no one else on this network does podcasts anymore, uh, CitizenCon happened two weekends ago, during the cold one. 
Uh, Mr. Roberts showed off a lot of what has been happening with Star Citizen in the past year, and then gave an awesome demo of their procedural planet stuff. Like, this is amazing. You know, if... Uh, have you ever looked into No Man's Sky? Yeah. And, like, uh, I, I don't think that you said you actually got it, did you? I didn't get it. So, um, apparently it's just been a rabid disappointment after disappointment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has. I've talked to a friend. He refuses the game for a couple of months because of how bad the ending was. <laughs> wow, it must have been worse than Mass Effect 3. But, uh, anyways. He, he says Mass Effect 3 was the most beautifully written thing compared to this. Yeah, well, now that I think about it, um, No Man's Sky has barely written anything because it's like... A, Pretty much all procedural generation. So, whereas uh, Star Citizen has uh, a little bit more substance and crafting going on. You know, I thought Star Citizen was done being built some time ago. You know, y you would have thought so, but like I've been kind of following it, and uh. they're like building the most sophisticated game engine ever, it seems like. I should download that game again. So, uh, yeah, you can actually, I think you can actually go around an entire star, star system in Star Citizen now. So, like, you can, uh, uh, like, spawn on a space station and, like, hop in your, uh, hop in your little spaceship and, like, do warp jumps across places. Wow. And, uh, like, I remember going to a derelict space station at one time and, like, grabbing some files. So, yeah. Huh. Um, I will, yeah, I'll have to try the game again because last time I couldn't play it because of my graphics card. So, and, but now for something a little bit closer and has a more solid release. The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim Special Edition. That comes out October 28th. If you have it on PC right now with all the DLC, you will get this for free. So... Hmm, interesting. Yeah, so I'm not sure. How, did you get all the DLC for that one, Chris? I did not, no. Okay. Um, I can't even connect to Steam to see what I'm missing. I think it's just the Dragon one, though. So, um, the Dragonborn one, let's see, yeah. Let's see, yeah, I think that was actually the better of the, uh, of the three. Oh, I did enjoy building a house and then going and kidnapping two children. <laughs> So, um, with all this said, uh, your games are getting repetitive, but I love you, Bethesda. So, um, pretty much you, you can look forward to better textures and better, uh, like better lighting effects and everything, because from what I can tell, this uses the Fallout 4 engine. So that, nice. sh yeah, that should be, uh, a lot more shiny, uh, in your very foggy and snowy Northern lands. <laughs> So, and, uh, well, you, uh, were speaking about, since I was, uh, talking about Skyrim there. Yeah. You remember some years Sorry. ago, we funded a Kickstarter for the Symphony. Yes. It's probably been, what, three, four years, maybe five? Something like that. Have you heard any updates on, besides the music sheets he keeps sending us when he plans on releasing it <laughs> uh nothing uh, as for a release date yet um see i remember one of these updates that he had i think it was like sort of like a little i want to i don't want to say breath analyzer but like maybe like a uh like a breath measurer or something so like if he would blow into it it would like make a flute sound louder or something. And Interesting. Like, yeah. And, like, he's uh, done, like, a few other sort of, like, inspiration things, but that's really been, like, several months between. So you feel like he's not actually carrying through in the Kickstarter money and he's just uh, <laughs> gaming it? <laughs> well, I mean, the what I would like to think is that, you know, since he sort of contracts out to you know, like actual game studios to make their soundtracks. I'm really hoping that he's just busy making all these soundtracks, like actually doing his job there. 
So, mm-hmm. uh, see, a Kickstarter was released March the thirteenth, twenty thirteen. At least so it's been three and a half years. Yeah. So, like, I actually remember reading through one of the, the uh, comments on one of these updates, and uh, I'm not sure if it was like something regarding the actual CDs that they would be sending out. And the guy, this one guy was kind of sad because, like, the the guy or maybe, like, the two people that he wanted to, like, give these to had already died or something. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was really sad. Wow. So. That, that, that is sad right there. So, yeah. Hopefully this is worth it. So. And. I don't uh, even remember how much I paid for it. Uh, yeah. I think I was, like, at $33 for like three discs or so okay yeah let's see i view my pledge and it wants my password (laughs) yeah um see it was maybe three or four months ago that i went through like most of the uh services that i use and did the two-factor authentication okay and kickstarter was one of them (laughs) so has kickstarter released the money to him i wonder or have they still holding it back well when you do a Kickstarter and like the campaign finishes successfully, you get the money right then. Okay, so he has the money. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it's always a gamble. I mean, I think out of everything I've Kickstarted, I've only had one successful game that's nearing completion, and that's Planet Explorer. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, speaking of, uh, there's the Road Redemption one. Which um, is nearing release, like it was supposed to be this month, but since they like live in Louisiana, like <laughs> there was there was a lot of flooding going on there a few months ago, so they're like, hey, sorry, we need to like push this back a little bit more, <laughs> but uh, supposedly wow. supposedly they just released the multiplayer, so so like I haven't tried that out yet, but uh, yeah, that's coming along, and I I need to jump back into there too. Anyways, uh, let's get on to some news. So, more Internet of Things means more walled gardens. All of these devices are technically remote controllable, but they might not use a standard protocol to interface with your fancy speech-enabled phone. So you spend 11 hours trying to get your Wi-Fi kettle to talk to your phone in order to make some tea. (laughs) Totally worth it. Yeah, this is like the most British tech thing you could ever imagine. The tea is done good, though. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if maybe people will gather around the, uh, was it the HTTP coffee pot control protocol or something? <laughs> you know, like the one with HTTP 418, I'm not a teapot. <laughs> yeah, they, they thought that they were joking back there, but nowadays that's a likely, uh, thing that might be implemented for real. <laughs> true. So, uh, anyways, uh, so remember TrueCrypt way back when? That would be the, the uh, encryption software that apparently just up and ended the project that people are making it, but it's open source, and so uh, some other people picked it up, and they made it into, uh, is it VeraCrypt? Yes, VeraCrypt. And, uh, let's see, I think we even had, like, a sort of series going on back there about the guy that was probably behind it. So, um, anyways, VeraCrypt is, I guess, sort of the successor to TrueCrypt. And, uh, like, way back before TrueCrypt was discontinued, there was a security audit, uh, on TrueCrypt, which actually turned up not bad. But it seems that Veracrypt has uh, some little bit more uh, critical bugs, it seems like, um, which supposedly will be fixed pretty soon. So, like, it has, you know, things like, you know, bootloader vulnerabilities, like, uh, like not erasing the keystrokes and stuff. So, yeah, that might be a little important. 
before you hand it off to another operating system. So now for something uh, a little bit weird. I, we don't really talk about uh, you know like actual physical bus interfaces, but Open Cappy is a new data bus that allows a more standard interface between CPUs and other internal accelerators, devices, and processors. Uh, it's short for Open Coherent Accelerator Processor Interface. So this is kind of like PCI Express, but on steroids. So uh, like I think PCI Express 3.0 uh, has like an eight gigabyte per second uh, lane rate, like, you know, like for each pin, uh, like each data pin has, you know, that much capacity. Uh, but for Open Cappy, that's like 25 gigabits or like gigabytes or something. Um, so this is like noticeably faster, but uh, like this uh, little introduction here doesn't exactly say, you know, like a device will have like eight of these or 16 of these or whatever. Um, this is like more of an announcement of sort of an alliance of like companies coming together to make this. Um, so, you know, it appears to be more for servers than for desktops, which is kind of sad. But, uh, you know, it'll just be like one of those exotic interfaces that you might see on, say, like an IBM mainframe or something. Because IBM is a part of this with AMD and NVIDIA and Zilinx, Google and HP Enterprises. So, like, a lot of important people except Intel. So, um, even with that, I think that this will be a, you know, sort of prevalent uh, connection standard. Okay. So, uh, did anyone else have comments on this? Uh, it seems, I think in the article I did mention some uh, about the div- trend now we have that it, lots can of Can you devices. speak into the Microsoft? Yes, I can speak into the Microsoft. We were talking about the trend now you were starting to see that with IoT, you have lots of different devices to connect to. So suddenly your processor might have to be talking to lots of different things. Maybe other processors and other devices and such. So that's uh, having a fast bus can be important for that. So you have all of these little weak computers talking to this one big giant thing that has like dedicated hardware for processing things. Wait, that was kind of uh, vague. Kind of. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, computing thrives on vagueness and abstractions. Yes, things that uh, Pennsylvania Chris hates. Yes. Not, not, not Tom, Chris. He, he's okay, right, Chris? Yep, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, enough about this hardware stuff. Well, I think we could talk about. Oh, what, what do you guys have thought on the election? A total nightmare. And you, Steve? Uh, it's not so good for the choices. I'd say. I've heard someone say this, and I think this is the best conclusion I can make of it all is you're not really voting for the candidate, but you're voting for the uh, judges that the candidate is likely to uh, appoint. So that's uh, a consideration. You're you're voting for people to vote someone else. Correct. As you referenced hmm. in the, the Fringe at some point in time, maybe not the Fringe pre-show Fringe. Yeah, the, uh, it's, uh, the Fringe Fringe. Democracy. It's the Republic. <laughs> So, you know, fringe fringe. Yeah. So, yeah. Speaking about IoT and its inherent you know, insecurities. Um, yeah. Like all these uh, voting machines are kind of ripe targets for that. Correct. So I, I saw this on the TV today and they're saying the electronic voting machines are outdated. Most of them are more than 10 years old. And I was thinking. You know, we only have an election every four years. That means these voting machines only get used twice, aside from local votes. Yeah, well, yeah, like twice a year. Yeah, so well, like twice, brand new twice in its junk. lifetime. <laughs> so, um, yeah, these these things tend to be kind of exotic, customized machines. Uh huh. So, um, majority of the world still likes to use paper. Yeah. I, I, you know, back in my day, we had hanging chads. <laughs> that's, that's the problem, is the software is, you need to have consistency there, and it's everyone's homebrew solution, 
if you made a system based it on Linux, so like say the Turkey, they made their custom super security military Linux, base it on something like that that's supposed to be really secure, and then make an open source software that runs the voting, add in the concept of we're talking about PA, we don't have an audit trail, which we don't. We They vote, and I even heard of a story from a man from my church, he said he voted one way, and when in the summary screen it showed something totally different, and he went back and changed it, and it was like, wouldn't take it, and so he had the, he called people up, and they came and removed the machine. Anyways, point is, we don't have the audit trail, but if they, someone collaboratively, if we made open source voting software and it became like a standard, then at least people would have a chance to poke with the code and look at it, find bugs, and uh, mm -hmm. maybe we could get standardized. Yeah. And like, but, uh, you know, there's going to be that one person that's debugging in production. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just flip this bit. No one will notice. <laughs> Let's see what this does. Whoops. <laughs> and now the White House is burning. <laughs> I, I heard of a system once that was kind of neat. It was, they were, I think it was more of a proposal rather than something they'd actually done. But somehow they were going to use these codes that look kind of like one of those I, I forget, 2D barcodes, I think is what they're called. Where they have like the dots and things more so kind of like what your cell phone would scan. Uh, QR that? code. QR code. There you go. That's what it is. It looks kind of like a QR code, but it would print two of them. And when you put them together, it was readable data, but separate it wasn't. And somehow the idea was then you would be given that and there was no way for them to trace back who it was that voted but then you could, if they needed a recount or something, you could bring your, your slip back and they could match it up somehow and then verify it. Mm. And like with a complete piece, they could, they could get the data back. It was an interesting concept. So interesting. So I know like a handful of states, like they don't have voting machines everywhere. They just send out paper ballots to everyone in the mail. So like, I kind of imagine that would kind of be like the, uh, like the tests back in grade school where like you fill in the little bubble on the sheet <laughs> and then and then well, like you don't there's, have to erase anything yeah and then there's like an ocr machine that goes vroom, 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 vroom. The trouble you know you know if if they're con so concerned about people hacking it i mean you're sending it out in the mail some guy could hijack the post office it could but it's going to be more limited quantities at that point in time as it was mentioned in the article uh, there were machines in Virginia that apparently had the Wi-Fi turned on and was unsecured. So apparently people could just, like, log in and do stuff. When you have something like that, I can s switch the ballots for, like, everyone in the machine, which could be hundreds of people, in one second, opposed to if I'm intercepting in the mail, it's going to actually take me time to mess with the hundreds of people's ballots. Correct. Plus, That's true. you know, plus the fact that, you know, not only are you doing election fraud, you're also stealing the mail, which is like a <laughs> which is a very federal offense. Yeah. And people would be asking, "Where's my ballot?" Yeah. You know, it's like, "Oh, lo and behold, like your ballot came back with your signature on it, but that doesn't exactly look like your signature. That's your neighbor's. It looks like everybody else's signature. Yeah. <laughs> One interesting attack that they mentioned there was you didn't necessarily have to change the votes to influence that. If they can disrupt the machines so they won't work or make them slow or something, you could influence elections that way. Because obviously if there was an area that you're pretty sure is not going to vote for you, you just kind of make sure their machines don't vote for you and voila. Hmm. So I, I think we should just do like American Idol with like dial this number, <laughs> cast your vote. <laughs> yeah, isn't it ironic? We can we have uh, systems that do already work for voting, and yet we can't figure out ours in the government. <laughs> yep. <laughs> hey, that would that would be dial up voting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I got a question. How would you like to grow your own plane? Grow my own plane. So uh, that's right. So grow a plane. Because the BEA system and the University of Glasgow foresee the time when new aircraft will be designed and chemically grown in a matter of weeks. Yeah. When, when you were first saying that, it's like, I know things that grow on planes. <laughs> 
<laughs> we're not talking about the fungus that keeps coming we're, back. We're, we're, we're doing that in the reverse. We're like actually growing aircraft. So it, mm-hmm. it, you mentioned in the article that uh, this is in some way related to 3D printing uh, in some way. I'm not sure how they're arranging the things so they grow, but uh, it, it sounds sounds interesting. The whole mm-hmm. 3D printing and everything is uh, a lot of possibilities to it, I'm seeing. Yeah, like you even have one. I do. I have a 3D printer. And oh, I even bro- I even broke it like right before I came. So my, my glass on the bed. I've I've had this glass for a while, so I understand if it breaks because it only cost a couple of dollars. Anyways, last print job, I started taking the pieces off and like this fuck of flake of gra- glass was on the bottom of one of the prints, which is like... It didn't crack the glass. Just imagine a piece of glass, not all the way through the glass, just like a flake of it just pulled right up off the glass. It's really strange, like a whole chip. And then I was taking another piece off, and it did it with another piece. So I don't know if that glass just finally got overstressed enough, and it just decided, okay, I'm done with this whole heat me up and glue stuff to Uh. me, then rip stuff off me thing. I've had it. I'm done. So, yes. Uh, went to uh, Lowe's on the way down here and picked up a new piece of glass. So, awesome. back, back in business, hopefully. But yeah, 3D, or not, 3D printed grown, grown planes. So this, uh, the whole quad chopper thing and all of that, this uh, can make that pretty fun. It was talking about designing designing them quickly and being able to put them, put them in production really fast. That could be very useful. And then we were watching the uh, the little YouTube video and it's saying that, you know, it's totally green and stuff. So, I mean, sure, you're dropping bombs and destroying people and <laughs> dropping, <laughs> dropping nukes. But it's a green airplane. It yes. did not hurt the environment to be made. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, mm-hmm. here's another interesting thing. Uh, it's one of the things with the 3D printing and all that that I remember reading a long time back. I th- think we talked about in the podcast it could be just something i read i think it's something i just read uh there's a person way back when this is before i had a printer he was had designed a 3d printed gun and he was talking how this could change gun laws and change things because yeah. everyone could have a gun anyone that wants a gun could have a gun well with this if like these chemically grown stations become a thing everyone that wants their war helicopter could have a war helicopter an <laughs> army of army of whatever's hey. you can grow out of this device you could grow your own car you could that yeah. would, there's, there's like all kinds of stuff you could do with this this is really neat because it, it seems like they can just form the circuitry right there in place so you can design your own circuits and just like grow them that would be really cool mm-hmm uh I could see a Transformer movie take coming out of this. <laughs> could be. Yeah, transform from a blob to something marginally useful. The video was pretty funny. Uh, Andrew and I watched it together, and they just show like a like this this black goo, and it just suddenly whoosh, it springs in the shape of the airplane. Or no, no, like, like splashes and yeah, swirls. Splashes or... and swirls. You're right. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, we were laughing. We were pretty sure it doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Uh. So, how about the LHC? The what now? The LHC, the uh, Large Hamster Collider. Uh, I hear it's doing pretty well. Up to 278,000 hamsters. <laughs> Wait, that's not right. <laughs> uh, it's a video I'll show you later. Okay, I, I need to see that. Sounds really funny. <laughs> You mean he hasn't seen the video? He he might have, but it's it's good to watch again anyways. I am blessed okay. with a terrible memory so that I can read books again, I can watch videos again, and I get just as much enjoyment out of them as the first time. <laughs> mm. But if you are bored, you can take a virtual tour of the command center at the Large Hadron Collider's home site. Yeah, in fact, I think you can uh, tour a lot of the LHC as well. well when I tried that, I, could, I was stuck at only one spot. I couldn't figure out how to walk down it. Orange. You know, it would be kind of nice if they stuck a camera in there like 
and then shot it around. <laughs> and this is the camera when it exploded. <laughs> Notice the things that are flying by the side and the stars. Uh, okay, I'm looking around the storage room. How exciting. Yay. So, like, I remember actually at one point, like, they actually had... Some of it that was apart, like they were doing repairs, and you could see like all these wires and stuff going around. Yeah, it was pretty neat. So this is essentially like Google Street View, but inside buildings. Yeah, it, interesting. Hmm. But so, have you ever done a Hello World? Yes, many, too many, and um, I don't think that it's real programming. Uh, about the time when I actually was old enough, or maybe not old enough, when I actually started programming in seriousness, I did a couple Hello Worlds, but very soon it became obvious that the culture of programming was kind of against those examples. Mm. Well, Hello World has its own Wikipedia page. You know, it doesn't surprise me. I, I understand. Yeah, it's because we don't have our own Wikipedia page. You, you saying for the podcast we should have our own? Yeah, why not? Why not? <laughs> Start one. It's a community editing based. All you need is a reference, and apparently it works. And if you make a web- website about our podcast that references the Wikipedia website as a source of information and reference Wikipedia back, we can fulfill the XKCD comic. Yes. It will be perfect. Uh. Oh, Steven, you seem to be having fun with this list I posted. Yes, way too much. Suspiciously. Suspiciously way too much. Possibly. Uh, So let's go find the list and find some of the good ones. So 101 ways... What is this list for all of our listeners? Apparently, it's 101 ways to tell if your software project is doomed. Number one, management has renamed its waterfall process to Agile Waterfall. At work, we actually have a name for this. It's called (laughs) Waterjile. We have mentioned that quite a few times. Uh, Let's find some good ones here. One of my favorite is your car had been towed from the office parking lot as it was thought abandoned. (laughs) So, I guess I have to do one. Um, Let's see. Uh, Which one was it? Uh, You know exactly how many compile warnings will cause an out-of-memory exception in your IDE. (laughs) How about uh, progress is now measured by the number of fixed bugs and not completed features? (laughs) Speaking Hmm. of, every bug is prioritized as critical and every feature is prioritized as trivial. (laughs) Your friends uh, with the janitor. Who knows? Your project manager has also been spotted consulting a new Ouija board. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see. One of them was uh, your manager can be replaced by an email forwarding script. Just... <laughs> that that somehow also spends his lunch hour crying in his car. <laughs> uh, every, uh, every bug is prioritized as critical. And yes, that does happen. Yes, yes. Too many times. Unfortunately. So concerned about the stuff that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, like, what? what is their problem? I know. I mean, it's, it's just that you can't use the entire service. You can send half a request. <laughs> Why would you want the whole thing? <laughs> Your team mm. believes ORM is a fad. So you do not understand the acronyms DRY, YAGNI, or KISS, but you understand WTF, PHB, and FUBAR. And apparently not IDE, because this list has used it twice, and you have no idea what it's talking about. <laughs> mm. I think one of my favorite is, daily you consider breaking your fingers for the short-term <laughs> disability check. <laughs> that one was really good. Yeah, uh... so... Yeah, that's it's pretty good. Yeah, here's, here's another one. Management cannot understand why anyone needs more than one, a single monitor. But hey, you're lucky to have a computer because you don't have your own computer 
And it's not paired programming. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I don't live anywhere near this hell. Maybe out of ignorance. I have no idea. <laughs> mm. But, you know, sometimes I do feel my manager is just an email forwarding script. <laughs> you know, you know, it's like, please stay over there, Steve. <laughs> so not not this Steve. I think I think we've gone over this in the previous podcast before. So the, the happy happy Steve. Yes, the cheerful morning Steve. Please go mm. away because I'm obviously not the happy Steve. <laughs> so and like he always seems to update us on like all the drama that happens after a client call. Like you know I wasn't there. Yeah, I don't need a review. I don't watch soap operas. I do not watch soap operas. In fact, I don't even watch TV. I just have Steve. <laughs> hmm. So. So, do either one of you guys know where the God object is? I'm I've, not talking about idols. I've heard tell of certain myths, but I have never encountered one myself. So. Apparently, the program, which I'll not mention that my uh, company uses, produces... To be fair, they bought it from someone else, so maybe it's not all from that. It makes heavy use of this pattern. <laughs> <laughs> the god object does too much or knows too much. Or both. It is yeah. an anti-pattern. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, it just so happens that, you know... I've experienced this where I'm just, you know, programming along. It's like, oh, I'll just, like, make a new function here, spin it out. And it's like, okay, just, like, spit all the variables into the class and everything. I'm like, okay, like, these things don't exactly go together in the same place. Nope. So, um, yeah. When that happens, you have a god object. So, um... (laughs) It's usually formed because of exactly that. Just need to add one more thing. That's Just right. One more thing. Forget about a single responsibility. Who needs that anyways? <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> and uh, also be careful. You do not fall into the big pu- big ball of mud, the bowl of spaghetti, or whatever complicated analogy you can come up with. Biscetti code. Yes, biscetti code. <laughs> mm. Well, my city just. Fixed uh, Spaghetti Junction not too long ago. Yeah, they they seem to happen in cities that are bigger than Pittsburgh. Yeah, you know, here you know we do have interstates, but they are few and far between because there's like hills and mountains and stuff everywhere, and we mm-hmm. have to make tunnels through mountains in order to get places. <laughs> mm. So, which turns out is not exactly a problem because. Like, there's coal mines, at least there used to be coal mines around here, so we have people who know how to make tunnels. That's good. So, anyways, um, let's go to some appreciate. Uh, I would like to appreciate content security policy. Uh, This is an HTTP header that, uh, you know, attaches itself to your uh, web requests, and you can configure it to... Uh, essentially eliminate some XSS attacks or cross-site scripting. So, you know, what it essentially does is it splits up all of the assets in your page, your scripts, your images, uh, uh, style sheets, uh, any, uh, was it, plugins and stuff. Uh, it splits those up into certain categories, and you can specify, okay, this domain can load these things. And like split it up like that. Interesting. Um, so, in if someone somehow manages to slip in like some JavaScript that will like steal your credit cards or something, um, if the user happens to be happens to have a browser that implements uh, cr- uh, this content security policy, um, it'll pick up on this header and deny that JavaScript from actually executing. Hmm. So, like, there's a lot of uh, hashes and stuff that you can use, or you can just, you know, say, okay, this website or this content delivery network can serve up these things. 
which is uh, pretty cool. And uh, Google has uh, released a evaluator to check your uh, headers. So, um, like, I found this and I sort of knew what it was, but I had not really optimized it. So mm-hmm. I went ahead and did that, and uh, looks like I'm pretty good. Nice. So, uh, had, had your uh, website ever been hacked yet? It has not. Um, but it was like down for about a month because, uh, uh, I had, you know, pretty much reformatted it and encrypted the hard drives and everything. So, yeah, I do remember you mentioning that in a podcast and nobody seemed to have noticed. Yeah. We have listeners. We do. Listener. Oh. Hey, we even have them on a show. Yes. We appreciate <laughs> you coming to the show and, and, and even encouraging us that you listen. Yes. So, um, it seems like you know all about that. Uh, so yeah, it was totally down for a month and no one seemed to care. (laughs) So, um, it seems that the only person who cares is me because I get frustrated that I don't post enough to it, which Mm -hmm. makes me even more frustrated and post even less to it. (laughs) Uh, You know, I, I still do use your site to show off a spruce. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's, it's always every now and then a good chuckle around the office. Just load it up and run through a few. Yeah, you always get something new. Yeah, I, I like the times when it's totally profound. Like, it doesn't really make sense, but I'm like, okay, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, know, it, you should try to sell it to a fortune cookie maker. Here you go. <laughs> These are the best fortune cookies. It'd be better than a lot of the current ones I've been getting lately. Yeah, with all the English going around. Yeah. But, um, (laughs) see. Yeah, I'm not not exactly sure if I want the blog to be something else. I mean, it is what it is, I guess. So, I just... Well, it has been a great, uh, sandbox for you. Yeah. Yeah, I finally got Star Citizen to download. You know, I like that you have to have an account with them to actually download it. Yeah, that that always strikes me as weird. Like, there's no... Uh, like, of course, you have to log into the website to, like, download the downloader. Uh-huh. And then you have to log into the downloader to actually get it. But there's no remember me on the downloader, which always mm-hmm. annoys the crap out of me. Yep. I have one flyable ship. Uh, as mm-hmm. do I. I think it's the 300i, because I uh, donated like 60 bucks way back when. So, okay, I think I, I think I was always a minimalist. So, uh, Except for Planet Explorer, I actually donated 100. Yeah, you, you always seem to be into those sandbox type games. I am. So, yeah, the, the one thing, uh, speaking about sandbox games and stuff, you know, like... Fallout 4, you know, playing through it, you know, I could not help but contrast it with The Witcher 3, which seemed to have a lot more depth in it. Like, the uh, the side quests actually had quite a bit of meat into them. They actually had, some of them actually had their own, like, sequences and stuff. And I kind of loved how the main quest, you know, sort of led you into them. Like, you know, mm. you suddenly you go over here because, oh, you need to meet up with your friend and, oh, the king died and like you're there at his wake and that starts off a whole new quest line. But then you realize, oh, the thing I wanted is not here. So your main quest wants you to go somewhere else. But this other quest is really interesting and you really want to figure out who the next king is. I do agree. So, uh, you know, whereas, you know, I kind of feel what Yahtzee is saying about how, like, all of Bethesda's games are, you know, kind of like, okay, here's your three options, but it kind of feels like you picked the wrong one. So, um, but yeah, and I, at some point, I just decided that, uh, like, Bethesda's games are just kind of repetitive now. So I've noticed most games seem to be repetitive now. 
So I guess we found the good ideas and are killing them. So. <sighs> Anyways. That's kind of why I've been just going back to indie games. Yeah, I need to start uh, back on those. So, like, especially this one indie game called Diablo 2, which uh, I've been uh, dabbling into on my uh, my old machine here. So, uh, meanwhile, uh, if you would like to contact us uh, or send us any feedback or something, uh, we can even read it on the air or on the show or whatever, because why did I say on the air? Because this is not radio. Anyways... If you would like to send us feedback, you can send it to us on the nexus.tv. In fact, there is a link beneath our pretty faces. And do not forget that today is International Backup Awareness Day, so back up all your games. And all your game saves. Because... And all your databases. And save your game every 30 seconds, because you never know when it's going to crash. Yes. Uh, save your IDE every 30 seconds, because you don't know when it will go be crashing. Mm, true. From all those out of memory errors. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as mentioned, I will be uh, having fun at a street fair, and uh, yeah, and probably using the tea some more. How about you, Steve? Well, it's uh, muzzle litter season for deer, so I'm planning on using some flint, which I collected from Ohio last weekend in my gun this weekend to maybe go out and try to shoot a deer so we shall see how that happens anything fun with you Chris? Uh, no I think my wife wants to go to the zoo and then go to a pumpkin patch pumpkin patch yeah in other words oh uh, speaking of which totally random I am an Uber driver and I am completely against the Self-driving Uber cars. That's just because they're gonna put you out of a uh, out of a job. Well, I mean, they're over here in Pittsburgh, so I'm not sure how long it would take for a self-driving Uber to make it to over to where you are. But I wouldn't imagine much longer. So, what if we use a Uber car to drive out to where he's at? Wouldn't it stay out there then and do its thing? I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I, I recall you mentioning that a few weeks ago, so, uh, yeah. People, people have been uh, wondering, you know, it's like, oh, have you seen these things? It's like, well, I remember seeing one of them uh, when I was out riding my bike once. Did um, you get hit by it? <laughs> uh, I, was, I was on a dedicated bike trail at the time, and it was on the road. So, like, there was, like, no conflict. But, uh, yeah, I was just, like, riding along, and I see... Like, what almost, what I imagine a Google Street View car looking like, because it had this huge thing on the roof with, like, a whole bunch of cameras. So, like, I thought, it's like, oh, is this, like, Street View or something? Smile. And then then I saw, like, Uber on the side. I'm like, Uber? Okay, that's weird. <laughs> and then I read about it, like, a few months later. And then I'm like, oh, that's what that thing was. So, mm. but uh, uh, yeah, Uber is extremely profitable. I mean, Kentucky Derby weekend alone <clears throat> for thirty-six hours that I drove, I netted seven hundred dollars. I know that. Hello. Hello. Oh, I thought I thought my screen froze for a moment. We didn't freeze, so. Anywho's, so yeah. That, All right, we got interference here. Uh, well, I guess that seems to be about as good as time as any to uh, say goodbye. So have a good one. You too. You too.